Sitting at the heart of Newark's downtown is an example of the grand excessive ambition with which Gutzon Borglum could approach his art. The bare statistics alone are impressive. The sprawling tableau of his Wars of America measures 42 feet long, 18 feet wide, and 17 feet tall. It features 42 individual larger-than-life human figures and two horses. It was the largest cast bronze sculpture of his career, and indeed it was said at the time of its creation to be the largest in the world. Wars of America was the third and most ambitious of the three public monuments to have their funding bequeathed to the city of Newark by the will of Amos H. Van Horn. The first of the three, the seat of Lincoln, had also been created by Borglum. And this would be the fourth example of Borglum's work for the city. After seated Lincoln in 1911, he created First Landing Party of the Founders of Newark and Indian and the Puritan, both in 1916. Wars of America, however, would have a longer and more troubled creation. At the end of the bloody Civil War, Americans sought to heal their civic psyche by honoring the sacrifices of their soldiers with public monuments and memorials. Cities and small towns alike were erecting monuments, markers, and tablets. Yet, at the start of the 20th century, New Jersey's largest city still had none. Subscriptions were taken up to help fund such a project, but progress had been slow at best. Among those disappointed by the lethargy was Amos Van Horn, himself having served as a private in Company A of the 26th New Jersey Volunteer Infantry in the Fredericksburg and Chancellorsville campaigns. He was honorably mustered out on June 27, 1863 at Newark, where he went on to make his fortune as a furniture dealer. When he died on December 26, 1908, he was able to leave a trust fund of $150,000 to fund the erection of the three public monuments. In his will, Van Horn describes seeing the completion of a soldier's monument as having, quote, always been one of my greatest desires. If it had not been completed by the time of his death, his estate was to bequeath $100,000 from the trust fund for the purpose. By 1920, with the first two monuments completed, his estate at last got around to fulfilling his wishes. The logical location for such a monument was Newark's military park, and Van Horn's will also stipulated that this was where it should be erected. The six-acre triangular plot was laid out as part of Robert Treat's original 1666 Puritan settlement as the Middle Commons. It was used as a training ground for soldiers during the French and Indian War and by George Washington's troops during the American Revolution. It was even rumored that Thomas Paine might have begun his essay, The American Crisis, while encamped there. After the Revolution, it became a public park, but was again used briefly as a military encampment during the War of 1812. During the Civil War, it was a site of recruitment for the Union Army. During the First World War, in addition to being a recruitment center, Military Park served as a location of Red Cross and Liberty Loan campaigns. The park was the natural location for the various soldiers' monuments that had been proposed. This one appeared in the Newark Sunday Call newspaper in 1907. None of these plans, however, would come to fruition until 1920. With funding secured by Van Horn's will and an obvious location, the first step was to find an artist to design it. Gutzon Borglum had good reason to think his chances of getting the commission were better than most. His previous works for the city had already solidified his reputation. He conceived of something more than the soldiers' and sailors' monuments that had become ubiquitous after the Civil War. Between Van Horn's death in 1908 and the call for designs in 1920, the United States had been involved in ten more conflicts in the American West, Mexico, Cuba, Nicaragua, Haiti, and the Dominican Republic. But it was the more than 117,000 American casualties of the late Great War that inspired a renewed popular interest in military memorialization. Borglum's idea was a monument encompassing all American wars. He wrote enthusiastically of the $100,000, quote, With that much money at my disposal, I can create a monument that will truly do honor to the brave men who have served America in times of war. His first inclination was for a more traditional design, a column surrounded by statues of soldiers from the wars to date in heroic action poses. But then a broader idea suggested itself, the concept of the citizen soldier. The United States had a professional military establishment, but its strength came from citizens 
joining or being conscripted for a limited time. This was rooted in the distrust of standing armies dating to the nation's founding. Thomas Jefferson had been particularly opposed to such standing armies, having witnessed from experience what they could mean when under the control of a monarch. In 1789, he described them as, quote, instruments so dangerous to the rights of the nation that governments should be restrained from keeping such instruments on foot, but in well-defined cases. Instead, when the need for an army arose, it would come from able-bodied men in the community who would return to civilian life once the danger had passed. The potential risks and sacrifices would therefore be shared, giving citizens a clear vested interest in the decision of the nation to make war. It was to this ideal that Goodson Borglum wanted to pay tribute. In the chicken coop turned studio behind his Stamford, Connecticut home, he crafted sketch models from clay and plaster until he had something he felt confident in submitting. In February 1921, Ralph E. Lum, a Newark lawyer who represented the Van Horn estate, announced Borglum the winner of the competition, but it was said the choice was made on the strength of his reputation alone and that the committee hadn't even looked at his sketches. Borglum described his design, first titled The Mobilization of America for a Newspaper. What I have finally produced is a group of men separating themselves from their civil occupations and home ties, assembling, organizing, and arming, and moving forward, carrying with them the accoutrements and implements of war. The action of the composition represents a people summoned to defend ideals. The group is placed upon an incline to emphasize the struggle and show the upward character of it. Back of the entire group is a soldier bidding goodbye to his wife and children, indicating in a very simple and descriptive manner the motive which induces a peaceful nation to take up arms. The agreed-to deadline was for the monument to be completed by 1923, though some fellow sculptors believed anything so ambitious might take as long as 20 years to finish. By this point in his career, however, Borglum was used to thinking big. He'd been working on the designs for the Confederate monument at Stone Mountain, Georgia in 1915, which was planned to be carved into the side of a mountain. He asserted, quote, any puny statue could never tell the heroic story of the American soldier and sailor. Borglum's first challenge for the Newark job was finding a space large enough to work in. His studio was already taken up by an equine statue of Union General Philip Sheridan, destined for a park in Chicago. So he began the process of building the armatures in a field outside his studio, and hired builders to start constructing a new studio literally around him as he worked. When the stone walls were high enough, his wife sewed together tarps for a roof that were later replaced by an old circus tent. He was assisted in hauling the 40 tons of clay that would ultimately go into the piece by two assistants, Luigi Del Bianco and Hugo Villa. The process of molding the clay into the huge forms was hard physical work. On nice days, Borgholm's wife Mary and their children, daughter Mary and son Lincoln, would bring lunch and urge him to take a break. But Borgholm was possessed of a perfectionist streak. Dissatisfied with the given figure, he would tear it down and start over. One sailor in particular was made and remade multiple times. Months went by and delays mounted. His attentions were drawn away by problems with Stone Mountain and, in 1922, the death of his brother, Sullen Borglum, at age 53 from complications following an appendectomy. Harsh winters didn't help either as rain and sleet leaked through the tent roof. The modeling clay froze despite bonfires as he labored in fur coat and hat. Borglum, of course, could not work with gloves, and his hands were sore and bleeding. The delays led Ralph Lum to wonder if the criticisms of the scale of Borglum's concept were correct, and that he would not only miss the deadline, but end up way over budget. His concerns only deepened when he learned that Borglum was having a hard time finding a foundry that could cast such a huge sculpture. One quote was for $120,000, when the total Van Horn bequeath had been $100,000. But Borglum was deaf to suggestions that he scale down the monument. Biographers later noted how obstinate he could be. Refusing to compromise, he kept writing foundries for quotes until, at last, he found one in Italy. Gosmano Vignali would do the job for $20,000. Missing the 1923 deadline, the final parts were shipped for casting in the summer of 1924. Further delays meant the already rescheduled November 11, 1925 unveiling had to also be canceled. His patient strain Lum lamented to Borglum how he was trying to put the subject out of his mind, quote, until someone tells me there is some chance of getting the monument during my lifetime. Borglum replied simply, 
trust me, a little longer. Public interest in the project had to be maintained throughout the delays. Borglum himself gave an interview on WOR Radio in March 1924. The station broadcast out of Bamberger's department store in Newark, where the plaster models were put on display in their windows. When Borglum had to be away to tend to the also troubled Stone Mountain project, Mary took over corresponding with Vignali in Italy. When the castings were completed, getting them from the foundry to the dock was complicated by their massive size. They tried building a custom truck, but local authorities refused to let them use it on their streets. He told her, quote, We therefore put eight string horses to a wagon. They were accompanied by a crew of electricians, because in many of the towns, electric wires had to be removed before the wagon with this giant load could pass. Once safely in Newark, the pieces were assembled, and the dedication could at last be scheduled, May 31, 1926. Depending on the source, the crowds on hand to witness the event were anywhere from 5,000 to 20,000. The discrepancies might have something to do with whether the count limited itself to those within Military Park alone, or included the many more in the surrounding streets or watching from the windows of nearby buildings. At the appointed moment, Alice May Ware, the grandniece of Amos Van Horn, drew apart the flag that had been covering the monument and two large yellow balloons carried off a flag of Newark to complete the dramatic unveiling. Among the more curious parts of the celebration was the release of 96 homing pigeons, two for each of the then 48 states of the Union, allegedly carrying messages to their respective governors, though how many managed to complete their voyages home remains unclear. In addition to Borglum, speakers included Governor Harry A. Moore, Brigadier General Hugh A. Drum, and Navy Secretary Curtis Wilbur. Hundreds of soldiers, sailors, and Marines marched on foot while others on horseback pulled caissons of artillery late of the battlefields of France. Borglum had been running about making last-minute arrangements and was still in his work clothes when he took to the stage. He seems to have been sincerely overwhelmed by the moment of triumph as he improvised, quote, It would be impossible for me to express the pleasure and gratitude to God that I am able today to deliver to you this memorial monument to the people who have founded and protected a new freedom in the world. Those who came to admire Wars of America could search for figures patterned after real people. Amos Van Horn was represented as a young Union Army volunteer, something he had actually been in 1861. A father and son were modeled after Borglum and his son, Lincoln. The World War aviator was fashioned after John Poroy Mitchell. He had been known as the Boy Mayor when he served as New York City's mayor from 1914 to 1917. When he lost re-election, he joined the Air Service as a flying cadet and achieved the rank of Major. He lost his life in a freak accident during a training flight in Louisiana on the morning of July 6, 1918, when his plane went into a sudden nosedive. His seatbelt had evidently been unfastened, and he fell out of the aircraft, plummeting some 500 feet to his death. The monument sits atop a granite pedestal made from stone evidently quarried from Stone Mountain, Georgia. Viewed from above, it forms the handle of a reflecting pool in the shape of a sword, and the motif was carried through to the surrounding fence. Some years later, Borglum traveled to Italy to visit the Vignali foundry. The owner asked him an odd question. How did he like the champagne? What champagne, Borglum replied. It seems that the workers had stashed bottles of bubbly inside the hollow bronze castings as a gift that never made it to Borglum. What became of them remains a mystery. Wars of America was unusual when compared with the war memorials of the time. Rather than lionize the exploits of an individual commander, or of some generic soldier or World War I doughboy, it symbolized the collective ideal of a free people rising to take up arms in defense of a cause. One figure was even said to represent a conscientious objector arguing with a recruiter. If true, it adds a degree of nuance to the piece, embracing the reluctance with which the people might make war. Goodson Borglum's association with the KKK, Stone Mountain, and personal views on white supremacy are all problematic today. Arguably, the ideal embodied in Wars of America could be seen as less controversial. As such, it raises the question of if we can separate the artist from their art. At what point do the perceived personal flaws of the individual outweigh the artistic merits of their work? Is this Borglum's monument, or does it ultimately belong to the people of Newark to interpret and even reinterpret? 
Setting Borglum aside, however, Wars of America could also be seen as a reminder that the United States hasn't always lived up to the ideals it represents. Critics of 20th and 21st century wars see in them acts of imperialism or fighting for elite corporate interests. In this, it is perhaps unfortunate that Borglum did not stick with his first name for the peace, the mobilization of America. The name Wars of America implies it celebrates the specific wars, not necessarily a citizen-soldier ideal. As a public space, Military Park has outgrown its martial roots. Aside from being a place for recreation and leisure, it has been the gathering place for demonstrations and protests, from the Civil Rights Movement to Occupy Wall Street to Black Lives Matter. The very militaristic theme of the park was challenged in 2019 when New Arts Justice and the Monuments Lab co-curated their A Call to Peace temporary public art installations. They challenged Wars of America by organizing around a central question, what is a timely monument for Newark? As Americans remove, reinterpret, recontextualize, and add new monumental art to their public spaces, the questions these processes raise are by no means simple. Yet, by acting as a catalyst for such important conversations, these public monuments are serving a purpose perhaps unimagined by their creators.